So yeah, my first question really was, what inspired you to write the book? The inspiration for the book came about when I was basically looking for answers to questions. So I would go into places, I'd see objects, and I'd hear about characters, maybe get a glimpse of a a face or a swirl of a bit of Arabic or Urdu writing, and I'd find that it wasn't straightforward to get answers about those things. And so I, you know, I just started doing a little bit of research every now and then, and I'd find out things and share them with friends. And I really thought, well, these are really fascinating stories and they need to be shared with people. So the inspiration came directly from the the places and the objects themselves, because although the book is called Hidden Heritage, some of it is not so hidden. It's hiding in plain sight. Yeah. Um, It's a question of a, a trained eye or looking out for certain things. We haven't had as many people of colour or Muslims or people from different backgrounds going into those sites and asking those questions or maybe not feeling comfortable enough asking questions. Yeah. And also about saying to people that if you live in Britain, this is a part of your heritage. It's a shared heritage and that you should be able to claim it as much as anyone else. So some of the stories you describe sort of show a fascination with in Mus- with Muslims and the Muslim world. So this was like pre 20th century. Mm-hmm. Was there more tolerance to Muslims in the past, do you think? Or was that interest just to establish political and trade links? Because I identify a, a sort of constant contradiction. Yeah. So you, you know, we begin at Elizabethan England and Elizabeth I is looking for, for new trade links um, because of what's happened with the Catholic church. Partly, I think there's a genuine curiosity But that's always coupled with cynical aims, whether it's trade and then later on in the book, once Britain develops an empire, it's about conquest. So for me, the the sort of curiosity and conquest always goes side by side. I don't think that we can romanticise the past in any way by saying, well, just because Elizabeth I exchanged letters with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire and the Moroccan kingdoms, therefore it must have been great for Muslims. Of course, it it's not that straightforward. At the same time as Elizabeth I is exchanging um, dialogue with leaders from the Orient, there are anti-Turk ballads being sung uh, in England at the time. And Turk at that time was used as a synonym for someone who was Muslim or someone from the East. And so you have both of those things going on simultaneously. It's just amazing enough to know that that there was this presence because the way it's sort of depicted in the mainstream narrative is that we just came with immigration. That was, I mean, that was such an important thing for me because even though there has been some good work recently, there is still this uh, popular depiction that immigration begins in the 1950s with the empire wind rush. And then you have South Asians from India and Pakistan coming over to Britain. And yes, that did happen, and it's true, but it's not the only story that should be told. And there is a much longer history that is rich uh, and complex uh, and fascinating. It's quite often disturbing, but it's a history that's there for the taking and and one that we should be telling. Islamophobia, people sort of talk about it like it's a new thing. Um, Do you feel like it was, there was always elements of it in the West. Um, So like you've got on one hand, Queen Victoria is interested in the East and she's got um, her loyal aide, Abdul Karim, the Munshi, and she's interested in in writing Urdu. But then her son sort of gets rid of all Mm. of like his his history and tries to erase him from existence. Um, And then you've got like the views about Turkish coffee and um, the Muslim soldiers, like on the one hand, they're welcome, but then they're like, oh, keep them away from the British women. Do you sort of have a view on that and like Islamophobia in the past? Well, we call it the term Islamophobia, but it certainly existed in different forms. And you see that as a, as a thread throughout the book, uh, as you point out, you know, yeah. the idea that people in England are hostile towards coffee because it comes from the Turks. It's stealing our husbands away. So you always have this um, fear, suspicion, hostility that exists. Um, But that is coupled with curiosity. And perhaps we can say that those two, sort of the curiosity and the fear and the hostility have always existed. So 
maybe it's not surprising that both of those things still exist today because they, they always have. And maybe one of the things that um, I hope the histories that I tell could be helpful in doing is, is thinking about how to navigate um, challenges that people find today. Mm. And, and for instance, does it change the perception of mosque building in this country? Yeah. To point to pe- point out to people that the first mosque structure was built back in 1762 at Kew Gardens. Yeah. And it was commissioned by a royal princess, the mother of George III. Yeah. Does that changed the perception of whether a mosque belongs in Britain or not. Um, Oscar Wilde saying imitation is a sincerest form of flattery. So then you've got like in Britain, people having like these oriental carpets you've got the coffee you've got um the buildings like that's a whole another side of things where you notice like in St Pancras like the the links with the the Cordoba Cordoba mosque Mm -hmm. um, you see that quite a lot so why if if we have this and why were Muslims omitted from the mainstream history of Britain one of the things that happens the, the book begins in Elizabethan England, when England, we don't even talk about Britain yet, England is the parochial power. And you have these large empires, um, the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire, the Mughal Empire, you also have the Kingdom of Morocco, that are much more superior um, economically and politically on the world stage. And no one's ever heard of little England and Elizabeth I. By the end of the book, when we get to the First World War, Britain has an empire and you know, during the Victorian period, it's obviously at, at its height. So there's a power uh, dynamic that's shifted. Mm. At one time, you have in Tudor and Stuart England, and then later in Georgian England, a sort of aspiration to look like the Orient so that people want the cultures and the language and the art and the, the, the produce of the Orient because it's seen as superior. Yeah. Um, and something that, that can dominate the world stage. And so there's a kind of a desire to emulate it in some ways. Um, yeah. Then later on, once Britain has an empire, uh, particularly during the Victorian period, you have uh, a process by which Britain is now the uh, superior um, power on the world stage. And so by the time um, the Ottoman Sultan makes Abdulaziz makes a, a visit to Britain he is now the, the seen as the inferior power and the sort of question is well how do we mold how do we mold what's left of the Ottoman Empire to look more like Britain mm. uh, how do we financialize it to look more like Europe yeah and so a, a, a power shift happens so that the Orient perhaps Muslims within that are no longer seen as superior and worthy of emulation, they're perhaps seen as inferior. And perhaps that's one reason why the history gets lost. More recently though, I think um, some of it is is, 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 is ignorance and laziness. So you have people who have very narrow visions telling a certain history of Britain um, that's very monocultural uh, and perhaps they don't know otherwise or they choose not to know otherwise because it suits them politically. Yeah. Um, and I think that is one of the, the things that should be pushed back against because it has no bearing on reality and the real facts of history. Yeah, exactly. And it's very one dimensional. Yeah. The other thing is that this is not just about doing a favour to minorities by allowing them to tell their histories. This is about a, the reality of history itself and what happened. But B, it's about placing Britain's history on the world stage. So why should we be happy with children only learning about a very narrow aspect of Tudor Britain. Why not tell them about the global context? And it's important to to remember that Britain is only one player on the world stage. And so to get a historical context on that, it's also, I think, uh, it adds something. Yeah, definitely. So you Um, mentioned like the blatant Islamophobia and that's fueled by media and public platforms and also the part played by um, the state and the national heritage sites like in terms of not telling the proper history Um, so do you have a view on like how we how we tackle this and and get like the real stories told? I think with heritage sites there's been some good work beginning and you have certain sites and organizations that Um, realize that they have items and objects in their collection that they're not doing justice to at the moment and that they should be telling um, the histories of those better even if 
it is a controversial or supposedly controversial thing to do. Mm. Um, I think some places are doing that already. Um, for me, I think it's also about um, making heritage sites and some of these organizations aware that there is an audience for yeah. telling these stories and hearing these stories. And, you know, I, I, I thought it was fascinating when I would, before I even began writing the book, when I would share some of the histories and research that I was coming across with friends and they'd say, oh, I, I never thought of that place. I would never go into that place. Yeah. Uh, and you know, these are people who are, many of whom have spent their entire lives in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and they feel sufficiently alienated from places of culture to not be able to go into them or feel there's nothing in them for, for, them. for them. And I, that's what I wanted to change. Yeah, exactly. I love where you stated in the book right at the beginning I think that Britain seems to suffer from historical amnesia but then you've showed examples of where like for example the smallpox vaccine mm. was bought from the Ottoman Empire by Lady Montagu and then interestingly the first Covid vaccine from Pfizer was developed by Turks um, so do you think like learning about this history and Britain's I think you've answered this already but learning about this history and Britain's links with the Muslim world can help break down these sort of um, Islamophobic views or like xenophobia? Yes, I hope so. I hope so. I hope that people can um, read these histories, engage with them and say, and not only does it uh, acknowledge a link with the Orient, um, uh, and, and sometimes that is inspiring in the sense that people in Britain were inspired to emulate it, but also look at the cultural richness um, and all of the things that 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 now exist in Britain because of the links with the Orient, whether that's coffee or inoculation uh, and, and very many other things. So my uh, final question really was just to sum it all up. And like this really resonated with me when you said in the book, um, I think right at the end, um, by choice and by bondage, we made these islands too. Um, and so for me, these stories and, and, and what I've sort of read about the Muslim world's impact in the West has made me feel more confident um, as a Muslim. And, um, you know, when, when you get racism or people saying go home and, oh, we civilized you in, in your countries, that kind of thing. So yeah, that statement really sort of rang true with me. And I wanted to ask you, did you feel a, a greater sense of belonging um, after all these the stories that you came across and, and wrote about in this book? I'm really glad to hear you say that because that's that's one of the reasons that I wanted to write the book is to give people that sense of belonging, that sense of ownership. I think, I mean, your question was about, did I find a greater sense of belonging? Um, I don't know if it's just about personal belonging, but it's certainly about empowering um, the next generation to be able to speak confidently about um, British history and their place in Britain uh you ask about that sort of what to do when racists say things like go home or we civilized you well some of the stories in hidden heritage might allow you I mean, i'm not suggesting that you quote passages of hidden heritage to <laughs> racist yelling abuse on the street but, um some of the stories might allow you to question who civilized whom uh, yeah. and <laughs> what uh home actually means Ultimately, for me, the long and short of hidden heritage is that it's, Britain couldn't be what it is today uh, without the long history of its relationship with the Orient uh, and with Muslim societies and people. Um, and that is something that we just simply have to acknowledge. Um, yeah, no, it was it was so nice to meet you. And I, I love thank you for doing it. And, I'm uh, really glad to hear yeah. that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Take care. Have a good day.